I found out after the, uh, I will say this before I start, that uh, Pastor Dave and his family are on vacation. They have some graduations, family graduations that they were committed to, to be out in Iowa, I think, and uh, so they're involved in open houses and graduations with family and things like that. So that's why he's not here. So uh, I told him I'd be willing to preach this morning, and after everyone picked themselves off the floor, um, they all signed on. Pastor, I will say this, I think Pastor John and Pastor Josh are a little, we were a little bit concerned because I said, I will go ahead and do welcoming announcements, I will go ahead and lead the music, and I'll preach. Well, they were afraid that if I did all of that, they would be irreplaceable, that one guy could do it all, you know, so I'm just doing this this morning, and uh, I will also say this, after the first service, I learned that I need to say this, um, this statement. Pastor John did not contribute to my message whatsoever, um, and my wife did not contribute to my message either. So this is all of me. So, okay. Take your Bibles, would you? Or your electronic device, whatever you have, and turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Many of you know that I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, Farm life gives you the opportunity to do many things. One thing that I enjoyed the most was working with machinery. There were a lot of things I did not enjoy. I will say this. Farming, for me, was um, a hard experience. We had a dairy farm. I think there's no worse kind of farming than dairy farming because this just never stops. But it taught me a lot. But I did enjoy this part, working with machinery. Um, One day, when I was working with machinery, my dad and I, we were out in the field. And he was on one tractor, mowing down the grass for hay. I was on another tractor, pulling another piece of equipment that would pick up the mowed grass, squeeze out all the juices, and leave it on the ground behind in a fluffed up fashion, much like the piece of equipment you see on the screen right now. This whole process allowed the grass to dry much faster so it could be baled into hay within a day or two. As I was working, I noticed my dad was stopped and was working on the mower he was pulling. I idled down the tractor I was on, stopped the machinery, and ran over to see what was wrong. We quickly determined that the mower was broke and the repairs it needed would have to be made back at the farm. Because I couldn't do any more until the mowing could resume, I ran back to my tractor that was idling, reached up, turned off the ignition switch, and rode back to the farm with my dad. The repairs took only about an hour and we were on the road again, headed back toward the field. As we approached the spot in the field where we had stopped, I noticed something very strange. The tractor I was using, it wasn't where I remembered it being. Maybe our minds were playing tricks on us. Could I have left it at another location? Sure, that must be it, I told myself. I jumped off my dad's tractor and went on my search. Maybe it's just on the other side of the uncut grass, I thought. I walked to that side of the field. No tractor. Then I thought, must be I left it at the crest of the hill, just out of sight. As I ran to the top of the hill, my heart sank as I saw nothing but a field of half-cut grass. I couldn't believe it. I had succeeded in losing an entire tractor and attached equipment. Luke chapter 15 shares three great parables of things being lost. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and finally, the lengthy and more familiar story of the parable of the prodigal son. Even those, these parables are mostly viewed as a lost sinner 
coming to Christ, I think we can also make application as it relates to things the believer can lose, which is what I want to talk about this morning. In Luke 15, verses 8 through 10, we read a parable of a woman who had lost something quite a bit smaller than what I had, yet it was still very significant to her. Look with, me, look with me at Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 8. This is what it says. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Pray with me, would you please? Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word this morning with our congregation and those listening abroad. I pray, Father, that uh, you will use these stammering lips to proclaim clearly the word of God that I would like to share this morning, that our hearts would be open to what you would have teach us, and that we would not leave this place the same way we came, making decisions that we need to make so that we might be more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Some years ago, a man by the name of James Hilton wrote a fictional book with the title, Lost Horizons. In this book, he tells of a certain Englishman who was taken off a plane in the mountains of Asia and carried to a place called Shangri-La. Shangri-La was a beautiful and wonderful place. Everyone there was happy and healthy. They had all they needed, and they never grew old. This man stayed in Shangri-La for a year, and then he returned to England. But he was not happy... So he made his way back to Shangri-La and to the rich and happy life he enjoyed there. He found his happiness where he had left it. This is true in every walk of life. We usually find the good things of life just where we lost them. In this passage we just read, Jesus tells of a woman who had a band of silver coins. One day she lost one of the coins so she lit a candle and swept the floor carefully until she found the lost coin. Then she called her friends and her neighbors to rejoice with her. In the days we live which are filled with stress and strain, some of us have lost our spiritual values. We are not living as close to God as we once did. And our faith is often of a lukewarm variety, and God seems afar off. Our Christianity doesn't have the warm glow of former days. Not only have we not experienced growth, but we have lost some things, some very valuable and worthwhile things. Surely we would like to recover them. I hope that in this message, I can share some things that will help find what may have been lost in your life this morning. Let's first look at some of the spiritual let's let's first look at what some of the spiritual values are that we can lose. Number 1, we can lose the realization of God's nearness. Some of you can remember how very near you felt to God right after your conversion. You felt he was by your side. You could hardly wait until it was time to go to church to hear more about him. I'm reminded of the story of a pastor who told of a young man who was saved through his ministry at his church. This fellow worked in a machine shop. Shortly after his salvation, the pastor went to the shop to visit him. The man stopped his machine and said, Pastor, life for me is certainly wonderful now. I get along with the boss better than I ever did. The work doesn't seem so monotonous in the hours. They don't seem nearly so long. What had happened to him? The boss, 
well, he was just as grouchy as ever. The work, well, it was just as tedious. And the hours, they were just as long. What was the difference? The difference was not that any of his outside circumstances had changed, but what he had become different on the inside. Christ had made the difference. In John 20, in verse 26, we see how that Thomas had lost his realization of God's presence. He doubted, if you remember, that Christ had risen from the grave. Remember that? But Jesus came to him and said this, Thomas, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. In the following verse, Thomas' response is given. What's he say? My Lord and my God. Some of us reach out to him today. He doesn't seem to be there for us. We've lost the sense of his presence. The question becomes, have we moved away or has he? God tells us in his word, I will never leave you or forsake you. So God doesn't move away. Not only can we lose the realization of God's nearness, we can also lose the joy of our salvation. In Psalm 51 and verse 12, after David's great sin with Bathsheba, he cries this out. He says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He had not lost his salvation, but he'd lost his joy. David knew that the joy of the Lord never keeps company with sin. Maybe you find yourself relating to the words of the songwriter Harlan Moore, who said this, Once I had everything, all the joy life could bring. Each day I lived, I yearned to talk with you, live in you, love in you. My faith was firm and strong, learning right, fearing wrong. But now love's not the way it used to be. Something's changed inside of me. I used to speak your words. Through my lips your voice was heard. There were so many then who came my way, I could help them find the way. But now my words are cold, joy is gone, love it's old. Would you ask yourself this question? Have you lost your joy? Another spiritual value we are all capable of losing is our power through prayer. Possibly you can remember a time when you lived so close to God that you talked to him as your best friend. You had a consistent time with the Lord when you poured your heart out to him, you committed your life to him anew and afresh each and every day. With the convenience of the Christian life and the priorities of other things, you find yourself now praying only when trouble comes into your life. God's forgotten the rest of the time in your life. You've lost something. Your prayer life is powerless. We can also lose the joy of serving the Lord. We've all met people who at one time were very active serving the Lord. They may even be people within our own families who, through some circumstances, that joy was lost and therefore the service ceased because it became a drudgery. The faithfulness to the task began to suffer and eventually they quit doing anything in the Lord's service. There may be some sitting here this morning where that's the case. Christian service no longer plays much of a part in your life. If the first question was, was asked, what spiritual values can we lose, then the second question we need to ask is, how is it possible that we lose these spiritual values? We learned earlier that David discovered sin had taken the joy of his salvation away. 
That joy, which was no doubt the most important thing to him as a believer in God. Somebody once said, As a cloud hides the face of the sun, so does sin hide the face of God. Sin is like a cancer. It gets into the life, it eats its way down into your heart, and it destroys your spiritual happiness. Neglect can also be a cause of losing spiritual values. Things we neglect can produce real problems for us. Neglect your business, and you will suffer loss. Neglect your health, and you will lose it. Neglect your diet, and you'll get fat, like me. <laughs> I feel like the person who said, I had a million dollar figure until inflation set in. Yeah. But neglect your family, well, those consequences can be really great. Even as important as these are, neglecting our spiritual life will be the most tragic of all. First, what can happen? You quit reading your Bible. Then, you begin to cease to pray. Pretty soon, you stay away from church. Before long, our spiritual life becomes dormant. We've talked about some spiritual values we can lose and how we can lose them. But the third question we need to ask provides some answers and gives us some hope. Where can we find these spiritual values that we've talked about that we may have lost? If we can lose the sense of God's nearness, I submit to you that we can find it through unquestioned trust in him. Psalm 73 in verse 28 says, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. You see, we must draw near to God. Have you moved away from him this morning? Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Proverbs 29, 25 the fear of man, or may I add, circumstances, people, or problems, bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. A certain woman had a saying, Fear not, God lives. One day she experienced some trouble in her life. Her faith began to waver, and she began to weep. Her little boy innocently looked at his mother and said, Mommy, did God die? As she looked at the sincerity of her son, it quickly brought her to her senses. When you learn to trust in God and begin to solely depend on him, it brings God very near. An aged woman boarded a train with a heavy bundle which she kept in her lap. The conductor said to her, Put your burden down. The train can carry both it and you. <laughs> Do you have troubles? Bring them to him. God says, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Faith in God's word and his promises gives us the realization of God's presence. Not only can we find God's nearness through unquestioned trust in him, but we can find the joy of salvation by exercising repentance and confession. Think with me again of David. How did he get back the joy of his salvation? Well, he repented of his sin. He cried out to God. And what happened? He was forgiven. If you've lost your joy, you can find it the same way. Repentance brings us closer to Christ, closer to the source of the believer's joy. How about power in prayer? Have you lost that this morning? James 4.2 says, Ye have not because ye ask not. 
I challenge you that power in prayer can be found on our knees. One of the greatest examples of this occurred in the mid to late 1800s. A name that we, most of us, know very well, George Mueller, was a preacher in England, and he had a burden for orphaned children. As a result, many orphanages were started under his direction. He constantly faced bills to pay or a need to buy food or clothes for all the orphans. Mr. Mueller spent many hours every day in prayer for the physical and the financial needs of the orphanages. In his journal, The Lord's Dealings with George Mueller, he tells how that one morning there was absolutely no food for breakfast. Reminding the orphans that they must not be late for school, George bowed his head and he gave thanks for the food which God was going to provide. <laughs> what happened? A moment later, someone knocked on the door. It was the local baker who sheepishly explained that he had been able, he'd been unable to sleep the night before. He could not understand why, but for some reason he had felt compelled to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, bake some extra bread, and bring it to the orphanage as soon as possible. Now just as the children had thanked the baker and were about to eat the fresh bread, there was another knock at the door. George opened the door to a distressed-looking milkman. He was having trouble with his cart and could not repair it with a heavy weight of, of the milk on it. Well, you know what happened. He asked George, would you be so kind to take this milk so I can repair my wagon and be on its way? <laughs> the orphans were able to eat a hearty breakfast that morning and also to arrive at school on time. George Mueller shared in his journal that the money to begin the orphanages and the finances needed to maintain them were supplied without ever telling a single person. That's what he said. He said he depended solely on power through prayer. From the beginning of the orphanages, this man who depended solely on the power of prayer until the, he died in 1898, over $5 million was provided by God solely as a result of him praying like that. From April of 1836 to May of 1898, 10,024 orphans received care. Between March of 1834 and May of 1898, 287,407 Bibles, 1,000,000, 459,506 New Testaments, 21,365 copies of the Book of Psalms, and 222,986 portions of the Word of God in foreign languages were distributed. During his ministry in England, George Mueller gave over $1 million to missions in addition to caring for the orphans, all through prayer. Have you lost your power in prayer this morning? Why not believe Matthew 21, 22? And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Claim Proverbs 15, 29. He heareth the prayer of the righteous. Proverbs 15, 8, and James 5, 16 that says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Believe that God can do great things in your life. He wants to hear from you. He wants to guide with the small decisions as well as the big ones. All you need to do is ask. How about our lost joy in Christian service? I submit to you that we can find it by returning to the Lord's work. Psalm 100 and verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. There's no joy comparable to that which is found in serving the Lord. 
A story is told of a Greek sculpture who was working on a statue to be placed high up in a temple where it would never be seen by passers-by. A friend who saw how detailed and careful the artist was said, No one will see your statue. Why do you waste your time like that? The sculpture replied, I'm not wasting my time. The gods will see it. Here is one who with great pain worked diligently on something that he believed only his false gods would see. How much more should we be committed to the service of the true and living God? He deserves our best Joy comes from giving the Lord things that cost us something. We should commit ourselves to not offering anything to Christ unless it costs us something. Then is he truly glorified and pleased with our gifts and service. If no one praises you, it will not matter. God will see your work and reward you for it. This reminds me of an event many years ago when a great organ recital was to take place at a certain hour. It was the days before electricity, and the man who was to pump the organ became ill. A famous composer volunteered to do the pumping. Someone asked him why he was willing to do such menial work. He replied, I love music so much that nothing I can do for it seems menial. Do we love Jesus that much? So much that nothing in his service seems menial? If that is true, then even the smallest task should bring us joy. What have you lost this morning? Have you lost the joy and the radiance that should be a part of every believer's life? Maybe you've lost some of these spiritual values that we've talked about. Maybe you have lost others we haven't mentioned. You will find Christ waiting to help you find them. It could be possible that he's been waiting for some of you for many years. I'd like to close this morning by sharing an event that happened in the life of a great artist. His name was Dore, D-O-R-E, Dore, a French artist. He was traveling through southern Europe when he lost his passport. When he came to the border, he was stopped by a border guard. He said to the officer, I have lost my passport, but I am Dor, the artist. Please, let me through. Oh, no, said the man. Many people represent themselves as some prominent person, but we don't let them through. The more the great artist pled the more stubborn the man became. Finally, the official said, all right, if you are door, take this pencil and draw a picture for me. Door seized the pencil, looked off for a minute at the majestic mountains in the valleys that lie before him, and he began to draw. Soon the official burst out, you may go. I know you are door. No other man could draw like that. May each one of us take a hard look at our life this morning. May I ask you this question? Is your life reproducing the life of Christ? Do your works testify of him? By what is seen can people tell that you belong to him? Remember my lost tractor. My dad and I continued our search until we noticed that some of the uncut grass that was still in the middle of the field, it was partially knocked down. We followed the trail with our worst suspicions realized at its end. There we found my lost tractor, equipment still attached at the bottom of a ravine. In a moment of recall, in the midst of my father's wrath, I realized what I had forgotten to do. 
In my, in my haste to ride back to the farm, I had forgotten to set the brake. The tractor, even though it looked level, it was not. And it began to roll slowly toward its impending doom, gaining the speed gravity would give it, flying off the side of the hill, and there it lay, crumpled and broken. Though sin and neglect may have you broken this morning, and though you may have lost your power and joy, and you may also be discouraged that you feel there's no way back to what you once were, I need to tell you this, that just as we repaired that broken, mangled tractor and put it back to full use again, God can repair your broken life and make you what he wants you to be. All you need to do is ask him. What is your need today? We have talked about things that the believer can lose. But do you know there is one thing a believer can never lose? He can never lose his salvation. Why? Because it's unconditional. Because it's all of God. All these other things we've talked about this morning, though, they are conditional. They're based on the way the believer chooses to live his life. Do you know what the worst thing is? The worst thing is to be lost in your sins and therefore never able to experience any of the spiritual values I've talked about this morning. Won't you trust him as your Savior today? Won't you tell him that, to ask him forgiveness for your sins won't you ask him to come into your life that you would be saved and spend eternity with him? You can do that even this morning as you sit there in your pew. How about you, believer? The Bible tells us that we'll never stay where we're at in our walk with the Lord. Did you get that? The Bible says we will never stay where we're at in our walk with the Lord. That's great if you're moving ahead. And growing but if you're not guess what you're slipping backwards there's no such thing as a plateau Christian you're either moving forward or you're going backwards it may be so slow that you haven't realized it until now that you are slipping backwards I believe God wants us to do an evaluation of our lives and make some decisions this morning to start moving ahead. Whatever your need is, please make that decision this morning. Make it while we prayerfully sing this morning. Would you stand with me, please? And if you know these words, which I think most of you do, I would encourage you to close your eyes because these words will be our final prayer this morning. With that in mind, pray these words with me. Search me.